It's the 22nd of September, 2015, and this is episode 249. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. Hey folks, Adam B. Levine here. On today's show, I wrap things up with a quick reading of a recent article published in the New York Times entitled, The Benefits of Allowing Bitcoin to Flourish. But first, I've got the guys from One Name on the Horn to talk about some blockchain activity underway over there. Enjoy the show. On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're joined by Muneeb and Ryan of One Name. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Thank you, Adam. So I reached out to you because of an odd event that happened about a week or two ago where about 40 Bitcoins worth about $10,000 seems to be sent to an address that nobody could own. So people were wondering if it was a mistake or if it was a if it was a burn and a project. And I heard through the grapevine that you guys know something about this or had something to do with it. So what's up? We actually noticed that post on uh, top of r slash Bitcoin the entire day. Yes, it was us. And... Uh, it was actually the start of our migration process from Namecoin to Bitcoin. At that time, we were actually still running tests. That's why we didn't actually come forward and publicly admit that this was one name and it was the beginning of our migration process. We actually just today announced more information about why we moved away from Namecoin and moved all of our 32,000 users to the Bitcoin blockchain. Well, so let's talk about what one name does. In a nutshell, what is it that you were doing on the Namecoin blockchain that you have now moved to the Bitcoin blockchain? So we have a decentralized identity system, and it is blockchain-based, and we actually started building it on top of Namecoin. Namecoin is very similar to Bitcoin, but it has a, a generic key value store on top of it for registering names and associating information with those names and making sure that the names are actually unique across the entire blockchain universe. So it's a directory system? Yes, yes. Okay, and so you were operating on Namecoin. So why did you move from Namecoin to Bitcoin? And I mean, let's start there. Why did you move Namecoin to Bitcoin? What wasn't serving your needs about Namecoin or what was so much better about Bitcoin? We launched uh, last year in March. 2014. And after that, we've had more than a year of experience of uh, running on top of Namecoin. One of the things that happened was late last year, we actually noticed that there was a single mining pool that had more than 50% mining power on Namecoin. And the scary thing was not that there was a single mining pool that had more than 51% mining power, but the scary thing was that nobody noticed. And that's where we actually started planning that we should be on the most secure chain, which happens to be the Bitcoin blockchain, and started our implementation of Namecoin on top of Bitcoin. So it took us around six months to get it production ready, and we recently just launched that implementation. We are actually really glad that we made that decision back then, because recently, if you look at the stats right now, the situation is even worse on Namecoin. Now it's between 60 and 70% hashing power is actually with one miner right now. Now, Namecoin is a merge mine coin with Bitcoin, if I remember correctly, right? Yes, that's correct. So then your other choice would have been to effectively become evangelists of Namecoin and to try and get more miners that were already mining Bitcoin to adopt it, because you're saying that this is a problem that isn't shared in Bitcoin, and yet they use basically, they, they have the same pool of potential miners, right? When somebody is a Bitcoin miner, they can mine Namecoin at basically no additional cost and earn an additional reward. You guys decided to move whole hog to the Bitcoin blockchain. So talk to me about that. You know, one of the downsides about using the Bitcoin blockchain is that arguably it's the most expensive per transaction blockchain from a, you know, actual like fees standpoint, really of of any of the major chains that are out there. So what was the advantage to being on the Bitcoin blockchain that justified that additional cost? So one quick thing is that actually it is not uh, zero additional cost to merge mine an additional blockchain. So for example, with, with Namecoin, it looks like it's it's free or very very cheap but in actuality what ends up happening is the miners have to spend additional time in maintaining the additional nodes and if you're working with a blockchain where the software 
is buggy or there's a lot of downtime. Actually, if, it, Namecoin is pretty, pretty, pretty buggy and uh, results in a lot of crashes. And we've been having a lot of difficulties with working with Namecoin software. So that has actually resulted in miners having difficulties with it. And uh, it actually seems to have been less than profitable for some of the miners, and which is why they actually switched off. And, and then as far as uh, the cost itself, it actually, we are less worried about that because when you're registering names, having a certain amount of cost in registering the names actually is an anti-squatting measure. So if you look at, for example, a namespace like the .com namespace in ICANN-DNS, the names you typically buy from registrar are about $10, and that actually makes sure that the inventory is not quickly exhausted. And so actually having slightly higher costs on the Bitcoin blockchain is not really a concern for us. And actually paying for the additional security of the network is very, very, very valuable. So the security, it really seems like that's it. Like what you're effectively doing is you're lodging records into the blockchain. And so ultimately, if the cost is two and a half cents or 10 cents, which is kind of the range of which it might be, depending on what the price of Bitcoin is, you know, relative to maybe paying a fraction of a penny, you know, with Namecoin, that difference doesn't really matter to you because you're going to be marking up the product and selling it to consumers anyways. So are many other people using Name Namecoin for that purpose? Because again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out it sounds like the any specializations that are offered by Namecoin, at least from your perspective as someone who was building a project on it, are not worth the, the decreased level of security that, that you get with that versus using the Bitcoin blockchain for that marginally increased cost, but the much superior security. Yeah, so the hash rate was definitely like the number one factor, but as you mentioned, that it was security in general. And another thing I would like to point out is that when you're doing transactions on the Namecoin network, there were also incidents when the transaction throughput was basically very, very little because the, the, of, of some bug in the miners and the miners were crashing and then restarting their nodes. About other projects that are using Namecoin, from our experience, what we have seen is that there's a major squatting problem on Namecoin that's going on. Actually, Arvind, as a professor at Princeton University, he, he wrote a very interesting paper analyzing all the different namespaces on Namecoin. And he actually pretty much concluded that the namespace that one name was using seems to be the only namespace that had real users on it. So now talk to me about multiple namespaces on Namecoin, because I'm not really sure I understood this. I thought that Namecoin was the blockchain of the specific dot bit, right? That was the suffix dot bit. But the way that your system works, you're, you're doing more of like you're using the blockchain to embed these records in. And then are you going through and kind of parsing them into a continuous record? Or is it just like somebody makes a request and then they go to the blockchain and find that one specific thing? Yeah. I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. Tell me how your system works a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So Namecoin definitely started off with the motivation of having the dot bit domain. And what they ended up creating was a very generic key value store where the keys are actually unique and human readable. And by convention, the d slash suffix or namespace for all the domain names. So d slash munib would map to munib.bit, right? And all the registrations for the dot bit domains would by convention go to the d slash namespace. So what, when we started using Namecoin, we started a new, new namespace on it called u slash uh, for users and defined the, the JSON format for profiles that need to be embedded there. Then our software would actually read data from the blockchain and display it as, as a profile that you would actually see on onename.com. Blockstore works in a very similar way in that it has multiple namespaces. But the difference is that in Namecoin, a namespace is, not, uh, is simply the result of that prefix, that d slash or that u slash. So the client interprets the name with a certain prefix at the front as a name in a certain namespace where u slash Ryan would be the name Ryan in the u namespace. But on Blockstore, the way it works is that we actually have an explicit start namespace operation. And so a, so a user can create a namespace and then set the parameters for that namespace. So for example, they can set the name pricing scheme for the names in that namespace. They can set the length of time that a name uh, is valid before it expires. Back to name pricing, actually, they can set a price curve so they can make sure that, for example, names in a given namespace 
they increase in price as the number of uh, letters increase or that they decrease in price if the, if the name has numbers or non-alphanumeric characters in it. We did this actually so that we could make sure that we could have namespaces that fit different use cases. So for example, you could have one namespace on Blockstore where the names cost $10, and this would be really great for a domain namespace because it would heavily disincentivize squatting. And uh, you could also make sure that the names are like, let's say they expire after a year. So that it's very similar to the, to the names on, that you'd register in the traditional DNS system. Okay, so let me, let me uh, break this down a little bit and make sure I understand what we're talking about here. On the Bitcoin network, you can have the Bitcoin token. On top of the Bitcoin network, you can have meta layers like Omni or like Counterparty. And then they each have their own you know, native layer that's their, that's their top level layer, but then they also have the ability to create tokens using that protocol on top of that. So you effectively have a three-tiered system here. And I think that that's what you're describing here too, is you're saying that Namecoin starts off with this dot bit, but that it has the facility to have additional higher level domains stacked on top of that. And then effectively what you've done is you've taken one of those higher level domains and you've created your own embedded protocol within it that acts as effectively a third layer on top of what would have been Namecoin, but you've now moved it to Bitcoin. And is that right? Kind of. Unpack it for me. Tell me where I'm wrong here because I'm, I'm getting a little lost. Okay, so what, what Namecoin did was that it basically took the main code base of Bitcoin and it added in new operations in the main protocol. That's why it had to be a separate blockchain. And later on, they realized that not a lot of people are mining it and they actually moved towards merged mining. And then we have seen that even that didn't work that well. What we realized was that you actually don't have to modify Bitcoin at all, and you can just use opt returns for announcing your protocol operations on the main Bitcoin blockchain. So you're right about the layering, that there is another layer on top. We are calling it a virtual chain. So imagine that the Bitcoin blockchain is the actual chain where, where all the operations are getting announced. And then in the virtual chain is where we process that information and construct the logic. Yes, it's very similar to how Counterparty works and uh, the others you mentioned. I would say that it's not three layers, though. It's rather the two. So it's the underlying, it's the sequence of blocks in the Bitcoin blockchain where each block is filled with transactions. And then, as Manip said, the virtual chain is a filtered version of the specific op return transactions where an invalid op return transaction is rejected from the sequence, and then that sequence is interpreted to build the view of the namespaces. So the only real difference here between this and Counterparty is just you're, you're, you have different protocols. You have a different set of rules, different things that you're intending to do, but functionally the mechanism that they accomplish creating new types of tokens is the same mechanism by which you're creating this, like you said, virtual chain on top of Bitcoin that can be this identity chain. So talk to me about the identity chain. You've moved to the Bitcoin blockchain. There can be, it seems like, just like there's a counterparty and an Omni that are, you know, are trying to do the same thing, doing it mostly the same way, and yet they are different brands existing on the same, you know, kind of parent blockchain in Bitcoin. It seems like the same thing could happen here. So what, what is your ambition with one name? How is it better served here than there? There are a few things that we need. We're building a decentralized identity system. And so we want users to be in control of their identities. We want users to be able to log into an application and be able to say, this is me, and not have to rely on remembering passwords. They don't have to rely on a third-party auth provider like Facebook or Google. This requires having users in control of something, a piece of information that no one else could possibly have, just very standard information security problem. In order to make it very convenient for users to actually use, then we needed some system to have persistent identities and then to have Usernames, unique human readable name that could uniquely identify someone and allow a person to very easily communicate to another person exactly who they are and allowing the user to have support very secure lookups because who wants to read off someone's PGP key and try to figure out exactly where to find them. Keeping that in mind, we needed a system that would support very reliable name registrations on top of a blockchain. And we needed a system that would support very reliable lookups. The software would need to be very easy to work with, very easy to add new features, very easy to run, very easy to get other people to run. 
popping up a level. It's basically if if our high level goal is that people should really be able to own their usernames and their data with a private key, just like they're able to own Bitcoins with a private key. So our system is basically designed to achieve that goal. So registering human readable unique names on the Bitcoin blockchain is just like one part of the picture. The second part is also the, the data that those users are then able to associate with their profiles. And one of the things that, that's really cool about Blockstore is also that now users can put in a lot more data about themselves. And also they can actually update parts of that data without sending transactions on the main Bitcoin blockchain. So it actually scales out really well. If you're, if you're thinking of building next generation social networks or next generation services like Twitter on top of, that are backed by a blockchain. So this actually provides a really solid foundation for building these applications on top. Okay, so you're talking about cryptographically owning your identity and cryptographically being able, you know, owning the, and changing this information, and yet it's not making transactions on the network. So to me, that says that you're doing some type of message signing here. So talk to me about that. What is it actually when I'm, when, you know, I register an account and it's going onto the blockchain, am I the one that's putting it on the blockchain? Where am I controlling my private keys? You know, these are the, kind of the basic questions if you're talking about really owning these things. In the protocol, your private key actually needs to sign the message with which you are registering that name. And then you also assign a data hash with that name that you just registered. And the data can actually live outside in external storage systems. By default, there is a DHT that we are running and the data is stored there. Inside the data, so the hash actually validates the contents of the data. So when the user signs the transaction that includes the hash that's associated with their username, then they're basically saying they're validating that this particular information is going to be associated with them. Information can also include, for example, a link to a location. It can be in the DHT. It can also be a URI to a location like S3, for example, which can contain additional information that would change and would be signed by the user. But also the user can put additional public keys inside of that information that's been hashed. So the user can then sign that information with auxiliary keys. Okay, so as the user, do I have a wallet that you've given me or do you have compatible wallets where I would be able to actually control these private keys? Because that's the thing I'm not really understanding here is how am I interfacing with this? Am I using your website or where am I keeping my private keys? Right now we have OneName.com and you can register an account on OneName.com and your keys will actually be stored and encrypted with us. We're actually going to be coming out with client-side software very soon, so a Chrome extension and an iOS app. And both of these, you'll be able to use them to store your names, your username, and your information. And then you'll also be able to use the Chrome extension, for example, to authenticate and log into websites. And one great thing about being on Bitcoin is that it's actually very easy to add this feature in existing wallets. In addition to owning Bitcoins, you can actually also own your, your usernames and data with that as well. It's basically the same technology and, and just adding those features is a lot less work than being on a completely separate network like Bitcoin. Yeah, you can imagine a wallet with a BIP32 extended public key where a given branch is uh, assigned to the user's name wallet. This is really cool. Um, it's very interesting to watch you move your kind of namespace from one blockchain to another blockchain. And one of the things that it brings to mind is that maybe this is something that's not just, you know, uniquely possible between dot bit potentially and, and, you know, your slash you namespace. It seems like this is something that could be done to dot coms or, you know, any, any of these other kind of top level domains where you could actually migrate from an existing system onto the blockchain using something very similar to what you guys are doing now. Have you thought about that at all? Blockstore actually has native support for it. There is an explicit operation that is called namespace import, and that's the operation that we use for migrating our own namespace and all the associated information from one blockchain to another blockchain. And the reasons for that is that our, our philosophy is that we just need to be on the most secure blockchain, whatever blockchain that happens to be. Today it's Bitcoin. Five, 10 years from now, if it happens to be some other blockchain, we can actually migrate over to 
to that blockchain. And, and as you said, that the same operation can actually be used to import another namespace from an ICANN DNS to a blockchain as well. So if people are interested in getting their own one name, it's uh, OneName.com? That's correct. So what's coming next? It seems like this was an interesting transition. You know, did you guys feel like it went well? And what's next on the agenda for one name? We're still actually in the process of finishing the migration. So we have migrated the users over, the actual usernames and accounts, but we're going to be flipping the switches in terms of resolving names off of the Bitcoin blockchain in a few days. So that's, that's coming up soon. And then the next big thing for us is actually releasing our Chrome extension. So users can actually use our authentication system to log into websites and they can actually take their usernames and identities and log into websites in a similar fashion to BitAuth or BitID or some of the other systems that you may have seen. Well, great. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking one last thing. One name is at least partly an open source project. Uh, talk to me about that. Talk to me about where people can go to get involved if they're interested in participating on that level. You know, what are the ways that they should get in touch with you? Yeah. So one of the really exciting things that happened recently was we started working closely with, with a couple of other companies in the Bitcoin space as well. And one thing led to another. And we started this open source blockchain community called Blockstack. And we contributed most of our open source projects to that community. So anyone who wants to go and check out our open source code, they should just go to github.com slash Blockstack. And just this Saturday was actually the first Blockstack Summit where over 100 people showed up, uh, lots of different companies and people talked about using the blockchain for various different things. And we were actually very excited about that part. Actually, the entire system, every single component of it is open source. So we have the registrars, we have the block store core code base, we have resolvers, all this stuff is open source on the Blockstack GitHub and anyone can run it. Today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is brought to you by Tokenly and the LTB Network, both of which have some exciting changes coming up in the near future that I can't tell you about yet. Today, we've got a track from Sound Position of the collaborative open source Cypherfunks project. I'll be back in a little over two minutes with this episode's magic word. Enjoy! Track is Stargazer, the artist is Sound Position, and the group is the Cypherfunks. You can check them out at thecypherfunks.com or find a link in the show notes. Today's magic word is star. That's S T A R. Star. You've got until the 29th of September to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener awards. Today I want to read you an article in addition to the interview we just played. This is from a deal book on New York Times was published on September 21st, 2015 by Michael Beckerman. Michael Beckerman is the president and chief executive of the Internet Association, which represents America's leading internet companies and their global community of users. 
And the article is entitled, The Benefits of Allowing Bitcoin to Flourish. Technological innovations that make it easier and faster for people to interact directly have spurred some of the largest periods of economic growth in recent memory. Consumers have benefited greatly from new products and services that have lowered costs and made lives better. Email drastically sped up and increased communications between people. Ride-sharing services connect drivers to riders faster and more cheaply. Massive open online courses, or MOOCs, quickly connect students with professors across the country. The common thread between all of these tools is that they connect peers directly, while also providing entrepreneurs with the tools to control and improve their lives. Finance is not a place where innovation is always thought of as a good thing. In fact, after the financial crisis, the prevailing wisdom was that most financial innovations, like derivatives, were dangerous. In the last few years, however, Bitcoin has proved to be a financial platform that follows in the tradition of the internet, empowering people to interact directly with each other, while providing a platform for entrepreneurs to innovate. For example, in the same way that simple message text protocol, that's a direct quote, it's actually the simple mail transfer protocol, allow messages to be sent and received globally for a fraction of the cost of a stamp, Bitcoin allows for, among other things, value transfer to occur in the same seamless manner. Think of it as digital cash, or the email for money. The positive impact of Bitcoin is most clear for international money transfers. Right now, it costs nearly 8% of the total amount sent to transfer money around the world, largely because of a complex web of third-party approvers. With Bitcoin and its public ledger, the costly middlemen are unnecessary. But this obvious benefit is only the beginning. Like the larger internet on which it's built, Bitcoin is a global and open system. Anyone with a computer or internet connection can plug into the network and participate. That is where its most promising potential lies. As the internet was allowed to flourish by limiting government's hand on the underlying protocol and its development, so too should Bitcoin. For years, Bitcoin sat at the fringes of the technology landscape as developers and users worked to improve its functionality and further its reach. Bitcoin startups in the larger digital currency ecosystem have gone mainstream, receiving major venture capital investments from the New York Stock Exchange, Andreessen Horowitz, Goldman Sachs, and others. NASDAQ is experimenting with trading assets on the blockchain, and Citibank is reportedly developing its own in-house digital currency. Most recently, the New York Stock Exchange began a real-time price index that tracks the valuation of Bitcoin based on data provided by Coinbase, a leading Bitcoin platform at the forefront of the industry and the first regulated Bitcoin exchange in the United States. Coinbase was specifically chosen by the exchange because of its commitment to transparency, security, and regulatory compliance in the Bitcoin market. But like other areas, we have to strike the right balance between helpful rules that protect and sustain progress and those that'll stifle innovation and economic growth. Indeed, platforms like Coinbase are already carrying out robust protections required by third parties like the New York Stock Exchange, illustrating their commitment to consumer.